On a beautiful day in October 2003, fishermen at sea discovered a female body floating on the Atlantic Ocean. When the police arrived, the inspectors were shocked to see that the body was unidentifiable due to being submerged in seawater for too long. In fact, the sight of rock crabs clinging to the pale thighs of the corpse made the investigators nearly vomit. Faced with difficulties in identifying the body, the case which seemed to have reached a dead end received new clues that revealed the truth of the story. A question arises. Who went to the trouble of flying out over the Atlantic Ocean to dispose of the body without leaving a trace? Could there be a hidden conspiracy behind it? Don't miss a single moment of this case. The gripping developments are yet to come. Watch the entire video to find out who the culprit is. First, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to receive notifications whenever a new video is released. The case took place in New Jersey, USA. New Jersey is one of the most economically developed states in the US. Not only that, but it is also a popular tourist destination with dreamy beaches, especially Cape May Beach. However, on a beautiful day, a shocking discovery that stunned the entire United States shattered the lively atmosphere of this tourist paradise. On October 8, 2003, as usual, fishermen set sail to go fishing. While steering the boat, one fisherman noticed a strange object floating on the surface of the sea. Upon closer inspection, he was horrified to discover that it was a female body and immediately called the police. Shortly thereafter, the police arrived at the scene to retrieve the body and conduct an autopsy to determine the cause of death. At the crime scene, Inspector James Thistle was shocked to see the condition of the victim. The body bore no signs of identification as it had been submerged in seawater for too long. Moreover, he nearly vomited at the scene when he saw a rock crab clinging to the inner thigh of the body. From this detail, the New Jersey State Police concluded that the body had sunk to the bottom of the ocean at some point, as rock crabs only live on the ocean floor. Since the unidentified female body appeared in the Atlantic Ocean, the USC Coast Guard USCG, assisted the state police in conducting the autopsy. The autopsy results revealed that the victim had been murdered, as evidenced by a large metal chain wrapped around her ankles and tape wrapped around her feet and hands. The police believe that the perpetrator may not have anticipated that the body would rise to the surface. However, how the killer managed to dispose of the body in this area remains a big question. James Thistle believed that the body was the only clue, so identifying the victim was of utmost importance. However, the police faced many difficulties that could potentially lead the case into a dead end, as the fingerprints on the body were wrinkled and distorted due to being submerged in seawater for an extended period. Undeterred, police enlisted experts to wrap threads around the finger joints, inject a saline solution into the flesh beneath the finger joints, and then roll it up, which allowed for the extraction of sufficient fingerprints for identification. Soon after, the unidentified female body was confirmed to be Kimberly Holton, 16 years old, who had been reported missing in Dover, Delaware, about 65 km from Cape May. Over a week after collecting crucial evidence, the New Jersey State Police immediately organized an investigative team and sent them to Delaware, where the victim had lived for a thorough investigation. According to the police investigation, Kimberly Holton, 16 years old, was born on November 4, 1986, in Kent County, USA. As a child, she had to live in difficult circumstances as her biological mother was a drug addict until a child care organization intervened. Later, Kimberly was adopted, but continuously had to move from one family to another in search of better living conditions until a couple in Dover, Delaware, Ronald and Lorraine Machette, decided to adopt her. The presence of Ronald and Lorraine provided Kimberly with a stable home, helping her escape from her previous uncertain and challenging life. However, Kimberly's troubles began to emerge and escalate with the arrival of her older sister, Heather. Heather was also the adopted daughter of the Machettes, a few years older than Kimberly. The Machettes hoped that the two adopted daughters would get along and bond as a family. 
Unfortunately, that did not happen. Kimberly and Heather argued frequently and constantly quarreled. Initially, minor disagreements gradually turned into intense arguments, creating a tense and heavy atmosphere in the household. Destiny Andrews, both a friend of Kimberly Holton, described her as a caring person who deeply loved others. Andrews believed that if Kimberly were still alive, she would surely pursue a career as a veterinarian or a veterinary technician. Kimberly's love for animals was profound. Andrews also implied that Kimberly had shared with her the difficulties in her family life, but was very skilled at concealing her pain behind a cheerful and optimistic exterior. That's how she didn't think about everything, Andrews said, highlighting how Kimberly used her lively personality to cope with negative emotions. According to Andrews, Kimberly was not only a good friend but also a diligent student, always serious about her studies and never missing school. One day, Andrews widely misunderstood depression and got into bicycles and started going for many walks all around town. One day, Andrews immediately felt worried and did not have toys like other children. Kimberly's first foster mother, Mrs. Cher Welsh of Williamstown, New Jersey, also shared that Kimberly's child was very difficult. The little girl was frequently starved and did not have toys like other children. On the fateful morning of September 30, 2003, eight days before Kimberly's body was discovered, she did not board the bus to school as usual. After a long day of waiting without her daughter returning, Mrs. Lorraine Machette, Kimberly's foster mother, went to the police station to report her missing. The New Jersey State Police were assigned to investigate. After Kimberly's body was found underwater, they collaborated with the Delaware State Police, DSP, to learn more about the victim's background and circumstances. Mrs. Lorraine also mentioned that this was not the first time Kimberly had disappeared. She had previously run away but later returned home on her own. However, this time, Mrs. Lorraine did not see her daughter come back, and her anxiety quickly turned into fear when she realized that something terrible had happened. From these clues, the police believed there were many issues within the Foster family. Returning to the task of finding evidence related to Kimberly's death, the detectives assigned to the case initially found no signs of injury and could not immediately explain her cause of death. However, after a medical examination, they discovered that Kimberly had suffered severe head trauma from a significant height. The strongest physical evidence the detectives had was a metal chain used to bind the victim's ankles. Detective Thistle noted that each link of the metal chain had a stamped number, which led the detectives to a Lowe's home improvement store not far from Kimberly's home. There, the store manager accessed the computer system to track the chain's information from its length and stamped number. They discovered that someone had purchased the chain just one day after Kimberly went missing, along with a padlock and a concrete block. The timestamp on the receipt helped authorities quickly identify surveillance footage at the checkout, which showed two men. However, due to the video being fuzzy and the items being paid for in cash, identifying these two men became difficult. I, faced with this situation, the investigators decided to publicize images of the two suspects in local media hoping to receive assistance from the public to solve the case. Immediately, they received numerous tip calls and someone pointed out that one of the two men who visited the store was Robert Brothers. Robert himself also called the hotline to admit that he had been with Jacob Jones when Jones bought the items for weightlifting but denied involvement in Kimberly's murder. The police found no reason for Brothers to lie. When they asked him to guess why Jones might hate Kimberly, Robert mentioned a name. Heather. Heather was the victim's foster sister and also Jacob Jones's girlfriend. When summoned to the police station, Heather tearfully admitted that she and Kimberly had indeed argued, but only about trivial matters like using cosmetics without permission or borrowing a pretty dress without asking first. However, Heather denied hating Kimberly to the extent of wanting to kill her, as both were foster sisters. I swear to God, I don't know what happened to Kim. I don't know if Jacob is involved in this or not. I don't know anything about it. All I know is that I am completely innocent, Heather cried out to the investigators. 
Jacob Jones was a 20-year-old sophomore at the University of Delaware with an outstanding academic record and no prior criminal history. According to reporter Jeff Brown from the Delaware Post, Jacob was enrolled in the aviation program and was a licensed pilot and instructor at Dover Air Force Base. He was certified to operate aircraft and frequently rented planes for personal flying. In interviews with the police, Jacob admitted to buying chains, locks, and a block of concrete, but claimed it was for weightlifting. However, the police did not believe him, especially since Jacob could not explain where these items were now. Faced with the situation, Jacob did not change his statement and quickly requested a lawyer. Jacob's supervisor told the police that in recent weeks, Jacob had shown many signs of unusual behavior. Specifically, he had not been arriving at work on time or was even absent, and when he was present, he appeared very agitated and angry. Records show that on September 30, 2003, Jacob flew a Cessna aircraft out of the base at 11.45 p.m. and returned the plane just two hours later. From this information, the police inferred that there might have been a second person involved in the case, at least to help Jacob move the body and secure it to the plane before dropping it into the sea. Investigators gathered additional crucial information through the autopsy, determining that the severe head injuries to Kimberly were the result of a fall from a height. This further reinforced the hypothesis that the victim's body had been dropped from the plane, causing the severe injuries that led to her tragic death. The next question was who the accomplice was and what the true motive behind the case was. On October 21, 2003, 10 days after Kimberly's body was discovered, a phone call from Jacob's father shocked the authorities. He reported that Jacob had committed suicide with a gun in his bedroom. However, even more shocking was that just minutes before his suicide, Jacob had confessed to his parents that he and a 23-year-old acquaintance Michael Keir had killed Kimberly Holton. According to Inspector Brown, Jacob told his father that Kimberly was causing trouble in the family, especially with his girlfriend Heather, and he felt that he needed to fix the situation. To execute this brutal plan, Jacob had received help from Michael Keir, who had worked as a security guard at the local racetrack alongside Jacob. Although the two only knew each other through work and did not have a close relationship or frequently spent time together, they committed this horrific crime together. Jacob's confession before his suicide helped illuminate the dark aspects of the case, providing the police with crucial leads to continue the investigation and bring the accomplice Michael Keir to justice. With new clues, the police immediately summoned Michael Keir for questioning. According to Michael's testimony, Jacob had requested him to pick up Kimberly on the evening of September 29, 2003 and take her to a motel to help resolve issues with Heather and Jacob. Shortly afterward, Michael picked up Kimberly and went to a convenience store following Jacob's instructions. He then took Kimberly to a budget inn motel. When Kimberly went to the bathroom, Jacob expressed his desire to kill her and asked Michael to help murder her and dispose of the body. I said he was crazy, I didn't want to get involved, I wanted to leave, but he said if I didn't help, he would kill me," Michael recounted. Michael continued the story, saying that he followed Jacob's instructions and grabbed Kimberly as she came out of the bathroom, holding her down while Jacob wrapped a phone cord around her neck and used a pillow to suffocate her until Kimberly stopped breathing. The crime took place around 2 a.m. on September 30, 2003. Michael confessed to helping Jacob move the body into the trunk of a car, leaving it there for several hours before flying it out from Cheswood, Delaware, and dumping it into the Atlantic Ocean. Police inspectors described the murder of Kimberly Holton as a horrifying event, from the method of the crime to the brutal details involved. This case not only shocked them, but also shook the communities of both states. On October 2004, 2003, the police announced the arrest of Michael Keir. According to authorities, Kimberly Holton's initial disappearance might have been considered a runaway case, but Jacob did not anticipate the natural factors of the ocean. From the height of the plane, when Kimberly's body hit the water, the impact was equivalent to slamming into concrete at a speed of over 200 kpr. 
Jacob's ignorance and mistake led to the failure of his plan and the exposure of the truth. On January 6, 2004, Michael Keir was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit the crime, resulting in a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Kimberly Holton's foster sister Heather was not charged in connection with the crime. Although Heather was involved in the issues Jacob mentioned in his confession, there was no evidence showing that she directly participated in or knew about the cruel plan. The case of throwing the girl's body from a plane into the Atlantic Ocean is one of the most shocking due to the perpetrator's cruelty. Due to personal disputes related to his girlfriend, Jacob, one of the masterminds, callously took the life of an innocent young girl. The incident not only shocked public opinion in the United States, but also raised fears about the cold-blooded and humane calculations behind this crime. Jacob, along with his accomplices, committed the heinous act without considering the terrible consequences they caused, making the case one of the most horrific and haunting stories in American history.